This is Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times, reporting from Upgadam refugee camp in eastern Chad. Before he became a world-famous journalist, Nicholas Kristof was a farm kid growing up in tiny Yamhill, Oregon. That's him driving a tractor in 1972 as his dad collected hay bales. I think one of my first memories was uh, learning to drive a tractor in this barn right behind me. And I had a nice, wonderful drive around the farm. Then I pulled it into the sheep shed behind me. And I hadn't realized that it takes a little longer to break a tractor than you might think. And I went right through the barn wall behind me. And um, so that was my first drive. And my first construction job was rebuilding the wall that I had just torn down. We no longer have sheep. This was our sheep barn. His um, mother still lives on the yeah, farm that his parents bought decades uh, ago. And the last two sheep were... Christoph remembers tending to the sheep that were here and to the orchards. Early pictures hint at the way he would butt heads with government leaders in the future. I asked him what it was about Yamhill that propelled him so far. Yamhill Carleton High School wasn't a great high school in the sense that the teachers have PhDs, uh, you know, the, the school didn't teach calculus or even pre-calculus. But on the other hand, the teachers really did respond to a kid who wanted to study and learn. Uh, I, I did an independent study and wrote a novel in high school, which I think one couldn't have, it was a really bad novel, <laughs> uh, but I think one probably couldn't have done that in, in other places. He liked the activities, liked showing sheep more than the classroom, in fact. His home life helped as well. Both his parents were professors at Portland State and filled the home with interesting books. My dad was a refugee who... Uh, was always talking on the phone with to people in different languages. And so that, I think, created a certain curiosity uh, about the world. And uh, likewise, I think, you know, we had amazing dinner table conversations about the world, about literature, about history. And I think I was lucky to be able to absorb a lot of that. It nurtured a curiosity and a confidence that encouraged him to challenge authority when he disagreed. I had various tangles uh, with the school administration over censorship in the school paper, over um, student funds, and those battles were at times painful, but I think they, you know, they were also a good learning experience. I mean, if I have a tangle now with the White House, then, you know, I was prepared for that in Yam Hill back in high school. <laughs> yeah. He got his first journalism job as soon as he got a driver's license. He covered agriculture for the News Register paper in McMinnville. After high school, he attended Harvard, then Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship to study law. It's a degree he's never formally used. If you ever want to see somebody in England, give me a call. <laughs> During those years, you could find him backpacking through West Africa, writing stories for the Oregonian and others to help finance his travels. After Oxford, he nearly became a law professor at Harvard, but instead found himself traveling on the tops of trains through places like Sudan as he studied Arabic in Egypt. A year later, he worked for the New York Times. In 1990, Christoph reported from China as the Tiananmen Square protest became a massacre. I took my bicycle and rode frantically down the main drag in Beijing, uh, Avenue of Eternal Peace, um, toward the gunfire as everybody else is running the other direction and thinking, this is a crazy job that we have that leads one to, to go toward gunfire when everybody with an ounce of sense is running away from it. And um, got there and um, just in time to see the troops open fire on crowds of, of protesters. He took it all in, then rushed to tell the world. My wife and the New York Times were actually kind of frantic because um, I was very close to missing my deadline, and they knew I would not lightly do that, so they feared that something bad might have happened. But I um, ran back to more Yamhill training, my Yamhill cross-country days, so I ran back to, uh, to the Bureau and filed just in time. And, um, led the paper six columns and have never been so sad to do that. He won his first of two Pulitzer Prizes for that, the highest award in journalism. His second came in 2006 for his coverage of the genocide in Darfur. We met with a dozen brave women, all of whom agreed to tell of the horrible abuse they suffered in Darfur. 
While he's been afraid, he's never shied away from danger. The day we spoke, he'd been on the phone trying to arrange trips to North Korea and Yemen. I know what you're thinking. Me too. So I asked him. Do you have a bajillion dollars in life insurance? Because <laughs> I just think, you know, of all the places you could go in the world, North Korea is a pretty spooky one, and I'm sure Yemen's not far behind. Yeah, I have been to North Korea twice. He said he follows the rules closely and stays out of trouble. I think frankly, that we may be drifting toward a cataclysmic uh, war with North Korea that would um, have hundreds of thousands of casualties, if not uh, millions, it would be a huge blow to the global economy. And um, governments aren't talking. I do think that we in journalism can provide some channel of communication that perhaps at the margins can result in better informed policy. With a front row seat to so much misery in the world, I wondered how he avoids becoming numb to it all. I frankly think that has happened to me, and I've caught myself in a, in a village in Darfur or in South Sudan, um, being so eager to find the, the most compelling story and victim that I've maybe lost a little bit of my humanity along the way. and. Then I sort of poke myself and, um, you know, remember that these are people just like my neighbors in Yamhill, and they've suffered things that no human being should ever have to suffer, and um, try to figure out how I can report on that in ways that will make my readers back in the U.S. spill their coffee and hopefully take some action. You are After more than 30 years as a journalist, Nicholas Kristof is working as hard as ever. He's proud of the impact he had in Darfur, forcing the White House to pay attention. He's also raised the profile on other human rights issues, including sex trafficking. He's from a small Oregon town, but his columns now reach the highest levels of power. And he's not about to slow down. It is satisfying when your target is a government that is busy massacring people. And if you can raise the cost of that kind of behavior, that's one of the great tools we have in journalism. And um, I hope that I will be able to wield that spotlight uh, for a long time to come.